Tonight, breaking news. Authorities searching for the parents of that teen suspect in the deadly school shooting. James and Jennifer Crumley failing to show up for a court appearance. They were charged with manslaughter in connection to the shooting at a Detroit high school that left four students dead. Prosecutors saying they gave their 15-year-old son access to that gun. Authorities also revealing disturbing text messages from the suspect's mother before and during the attack. Plus, the Omicron variant confirmed in several more states states as confusion grows over new travel guidelines set to take effect on Monday. What anyone heading on vacation needs to know. The variant also causing a volatile week in the stock market and the new question will at home tests work with this new mutation inside Epstein's mansion. Prosecutors in the Ghislaine Maxwell trial showing disturbing photos of underage girls found at the home of Jeffrey Epstein. His former house manager taking the stand testifying Maxwell wrote a 58 page manual that said quote you see nothing hear nothing say nothing plus the bizarre piece of evidence just brought into the courtroom Baldwin's defense Alec Baldwin saying he never fully cocked the gun or pulled the trigger before that deadly set shooting a prop gun expert joins top story live to break down if that's possible stolen money found a plumber recovering hundreds of thousands of dollars discovering it inside the walls of Joel Osteen's mega church years after they reported $600,000 was stolen and buried in ash. The haunting new images from Spain's La Palma Island showing the apocalyptic scene there after 10 straight weeks of volcanic eruptions. Top story starts right now. And good evening, I'm Tom Yamas. We begin top story tonight with breaking news and the manhunt for the parents of that suspect in the deadly high school shooting in Michigan. Authorities say James and Jennifer Crumley missed a court appearance today after they were charged with four counts of involuntary manslaughter. Prosecutors saying they contributed to Tuesday's shooting at a Detroit high school that left four students dead and eight other people injured because they allegedly gave their son access to the gun he used. Their 15-year-old son, Ethan, has been charged as an adult with two dozen crimes, including murder and terrorism. Tonight, we're learning about a violent note he wrote hours before the attack and chilling text messages from his mother. The Crumley's lawyer telling NBC News they are not fleeing the law and left town for their own safety. They say the parents are planning to turn themselves in. We have a lot to get to tonight, and we begin with Megan Fitzgerald, who leads us off from Michigan. Tonight, the parents of accused school shooter Ethan Crumbly are about to turn themselves in, according to their attorney, after being charged with four counts of involuntary manslaughter in connection with Tuesday's deadly attack at a Michigan high school. At one point, the sheriff saying the parents were on the run. So we have our fugitive apprehension team. We in consulting uh, with the FBI and also the U.S. Marshals fugitive team. Earlier in a stunning press conference, prosecutors laying out a portrait of Jennifer and James Crumbly's actions leading up to the attack allegedly carried out by their 15 year old son. The facts of this case are so egregious. They say the suspect was there at the store when his dad bought the semi-automatic handgun. His mother saying on social media it was her son's, quote, Christmas present. Earlier that week, prosecutors say a teacher had been alarmed, catching the suspect doing an online search for bullets on his phone. But his parents allegedly ignoring calls from the school. His mother, Jennifer Crumbly, texting her son, quote, LOL, I'm not mad at you. You have to learn how not to get caught. And then the day of the attack, a teacher discovering the suspect's disturbing drawings. A drawing of a semi-automatic handgun pointing at the words, quote, the thoughts won't stop, help me, end quote. Between the drawing of the gun and the bullet is a drawing of a person who appears to have been shot twice and bleeding. Below that figure is a drawing of a laughing emoji. Both parents were called to the school and shown the drawings, but prosecutors say they never searched their son's backpack or told the school their son had access to a gun. This doesn't just have impact me as a prosecutor and a lawyer, it impacts me as a mother. The notion that a parent could read those words and also know that their son had access to a deadly weapon that they gave him is unconscionable and, it, and I think it's criminal. The suspect was allowed to return to class. After reports of the school shooting, Jennifer Crumbly allegedly texting her son, quote, Ethan, don't do it. James Crumbly driving home to search for the gun that authorities say was kept in an unlocked drawer, but it was gone. 
Just last night, the school superintendent responding to criticism, the school should have done more. There's been a lot of talk about the student that was apprehended, uh, that he was, you know, called up to the office. No discipline was warranted. But tonight, the prosecutor telling us school officials could still face charges. If the school took different actions, would four kids be dead? I think that's really obvious. If he had just been removed from the school at that time, you wouldn't have had that situation. All right, Megan Fitzgerald joins us now live from Pontiac, Michigan, right next to Oxford where the attack took place. So, Megan, what do we know about where the parents are tonight? Well, tonight the sheriff tells us that they still haven't turned themselves in. The attorney saying uh, that they left for their own safety and they're on their way back. Uh, meanwhile, the prosecutor here says that these charges should send a message to gun owners that if they don't uphold their responsibilities, there's criminal consequences. Tom. All right, Megan Fitzgerald leading us off tonight on Top Story. Megan, thank you. With more on the charges those parents face in the manhunt happening right now, we're joined by former FBI agent and prosecutor Catherine Schweit. So, Catherine, I want to start now with what we heard in Megan's piece there. Police are consulting with the FBI and the U.S. Marshals. What exactly does that mean in the manhunt tonight? You know, this is the Detroit area. There's a, there's a coordinated fugitive task force between the FBI, the Marshals Service, Oakland County Sheriff's Office, and other departments. And they know how to do this. They do this every day, searching for people. So what they're doing tonight, you know, Michigan, it's, it's going to be below freezing tonight. It's cold. They're going to be out there even if the attorney says, hey, they're coming back, whatever that means. They're going to be out there looking to see if they can find out where these individuals are. And by that, when I say looking, you know, they know a car, they know a license plate. They're going to be checking license plate readers throughout the state. And also, you know, into Canada, they probably have the RCMP uh, engaged. Uh, this is not far from the Canadian border. Um, all of the northern part of the state is, you know, cabins and trees and forest and stuff. So it's possible that they, they just went and held up at somebody else's cabin, for instance. It would have limited access and maybe their attorney is talking them into coming back. But for the FBI, uh, the sheriff's office, the uh, marshal service, they're going to run uh, out every tip they might have, whether it comes from security cameras or whether it comes from uh, credit card records, phone records, uh, because they know how to do this and they do it every day. They'll, they'll find them. You, you said their lawyers are mentioning they, they are going to come back. But if they did cross over into Canada, because it is so easy, as you mentioned there in Detroit, how much more complicated does this get? Well, I think it would be complicated in theory, right? But we do all the time. Well, you know, we have a good relationship with Canada. And, um, and so we know how to work with the RCMP to see if we can track down anybody who might be a fugitive there, bring them back over the border. Do you buy the story? I know you, you, you heard the report there from Megan. Do you buy the story that they left because of their safety and law enforcement essentially really had no idea? Well, uh, it's clear that law enforcement, I think, didn't know that because of the statements that the sheriff's office has made. However, I think that, uh, you know, they certainly could have chosen to go into hiding, so to speak. Their house is well known and they wouldn't want to be staying at their house. I, I respect that. I appreciate the fact that they might have been overwhelmed themselves. There's certainly uh, may even get uh, threats against them uh, because of what's what's occurred. It's a very hot, volatile situation right now. And the fact that they might have been in hiding or gone someplace is fine. But the communication is clear that maybe they told their attorney they'd be back and they didn't come back. And their attorney has spent the last day talking them into coming back is what it kind of sounds like if I was speculating, which is all I'm doing. I think they're trying to talk them into coming back now saying, it's so much worse for you if you flee. It's so much worse. You know, Catherine, we cover all these school shootings there. They are terribly sad. What's new about yeah. this one is that it seems like prosecutors are going a step further in going after sort of the root cause of this problem. It, they are going after the parents. And from Megan's story there, it sounds like they may be even going after school administrators. Would they have a case against the school? Well, now you're asking me to put my former prosecutor hat on and I'm, you know, I'm so I'm winging it here in terms of that. Um, but I'd say, you know, the, the, the question is, you know, pro proximate cause is kind of how we look at it, things from a legal standpoint. And the parents, uh, there certainly is a proximate cause, a connection, causal connection there that to me is pretty, pretty clear and convincing in terms of being able to file those charges and argue that. Um, but the school, not so clear. 
um, on what the school's duty was and their obligation to, for instance, um, keep the child in school, to search a backpack. Would there have been a cause to search the backpack? Absolutely. Would there have been cause to cause, call the police? Absolutely. But for the parents, I think what you saw with uh, regard to the parents is maybe buying the gun, which was improper because they bought a gun for a minor. That's a straw purchase. That's impro improper, but a, a crime. But maybe uh, allowing the child to have the gun, shoot with the gun, as long as the parents are there, that's usually legal. But the escalating problem of knowing the text messages that were going back and forth, getting called to the school, the information that came in from the teachers, that information being relayed to the administrators, the administrators telling the parents, and then the parents still choosing to let the child go back to school, not volunteering at that meeting with the school officials, which maybe they did, but it doesn't sound like they did, that the child had access to a weapon, not going back to check and see if that weapon was there or asking the boy about the weapon. There's a lot of connection there that, that can show involuntary manslaughter. I think it's an arguable case. Catherine Schweit for us tonight, former FBI agent and prosecutor. We thank you for your time. The other major headline we're following tonight, the Omicron variant, now reported in several more states. Health experts reiterate that variant is a cause for concern, but not panic. However, there is growing confusion over new travel restrictions set to go in effect in just a few days. NBC's Tom Costello has the latest. Spreading twice as fast as the Delta variant, Omicron is in 40 countries tonight and popping up across the USA every day. From Hawaii in the west to New York in the east, six cases in Nebraska alone connected to one person's trip to Nigeria. I would consider the cases to be mild to moderate. But for now, experts say the real threat is more Delta than Omicron. On average, 860 people still dying every day. The unvaccinated 11 times more likely to be hospitalized, 14 times more likely to die than those who are vaccinated. At UW Health Swedish American Hospital in Rockford, Illinois, they've never seen so many COVID cases at once. 108 patients hospitalized, 20 in the ICU on ventilators, all but one unvaccinated. ICU Dr. Tabasim Nafsi must call families when a loved one dies. So those people who are becoming severely ill, most of them are unvaccinated. I just, I cannot comprehend as to why people wouldn't just go and get the vaccine we know which works. Meanwhile tonight, confusion for travelers overseas as new rules take effect Monday that require a negative COVID test within 24 hours of departure from a foreign airport. In London tonight, Matthew Cortland, who owns immersive experience bars in New York, London and Scotland, has a lot of questions about his return trip to the U.S., which includes a 24-hour layover in Sweden. So then I assume we need to get another test in that country before we get back on the second leg of the layover back to the U.S. It's just, it's just kind of unclear. If you're returning from overseas, the CDC says you can use a quick antigen home test, but a telemedicine rep must witness your test. A more expensive PCR test is okay, but not required. Many airlines, airports, and hotels sell the tests. So we're going to swab each nostril beginning with your left. Before I returned to the U.S. in September, a telemedicine rep watched me take the antigen test I'd bought from the airline. All right, Tom Costello joins us now from Reagan National Airport. And Tom, I want to go back to those new rules for people traveling abroad because there may be some people that may be stuck in other countries right now. What exactly are the rules if you have a layover? Will you have to get retested before you board that flight to the U.S.? So if it's a layover, like this gentleman that we saw in our story, if it's a layover where you're in, for example, Stockholm for 12 hours or so, no, as long as it's part of a continuous flight onto the United States, you don't need to get tested again. If, however, you're in Rome and you're going Rome to Frankfurt to Copenhagen and then to London and then, yeah, I'm sorry, that's too many stops. To, and therefore, you would probably need to get tested again before your final flight to the United States. But if you're starting in London, like he is, and then you go via Stockholm, layover for 12 hours, then to the States? No. As long as you tested before the, the first flight, you're okay. All right, Tom Costello clearing that up for us. Tom, we thank you for that. We turn now to the disturbing new evidence in the Ghislaine Maxwell trial. The jury shown photos of underage girls found in Jeffrey Epstein's Palm Beach mansion. The prosecution arguing Maxwell was in charge of that household and is guilty of luring those girls into a web of abuse. Stephanie Gosk reports. 
Ghislaine Maxwell's defense described Jeffrey Epstein's homes as small boutique hotels. They were very luxurious, her attorneys told the jury. They were vacation spots. Today in court, the prosecution challenged that description with what they called disturbing evidence from Epstein's Palm Beach mansion, seized during this search of his home in 2005, the video obtained by NBC News. The jury was shown a photo that was in the entrance to Epstein's master bedroom of an underage girl posing in a, quote, sexualized position. There was another photo of Epstein posing with a minor in her underwear. Prosecutors arguing the photos, alongside testimony from a former property manager, undermines the defense's argument that Epstein was an upstanding member of society. We can hear about uh, his conduct with regard to young girls, but to see them, I think, really puts into perspective their age, their youth, their innocence, uh, the kind of conduct that was occurring at his home. And so I think photos can be extremely powerful. The property manager, Juan Alese, testified he saw Epstein and Maxwell interacting with hundreds of women, some of them underage. Over the decade, he was employed by the convicted sex offender. Maxwell is charged with six counts of human trafficking, luring teenage girls for Epstein to abuse. What they're saying is Jelaine Maxwell is also to blame for her own role, her own conduct. And so some of the things we've heard so far is about how she recruited some of the girls, how she groomed them, how she uh, normalized sexual behavior. And that's a really big and important part of the success of his scheme. The prosecution also introduced a 58-page manual handed out by Maxwell to staff with strict and specific rules, like never disclose Mr. Epstein or Miss Maxwell's activities or whereabouts to anyone. And remember that you see nothing, hear nothing, say nothing. Staffers were also ordered to keep a gun placed in the bedside table drawer. She was a, a strict enforcer of those rules as well as the author of those rules. So I think that is the fact that's really important here is casting her in this leadership role. Another incredible day in court. Stephanie Goss joins us now here on set. And Steph, it seems with the video that we saw in your story, prosecutors are trying to tell a story here and something pretty remarkable happened in court today, right? Yeah. And it was an incredible day in court, you know, and I want to take you back a little bit to this house manager, Juan Alese, who said that Ghislaine Maxwell was the lady of the house. Well, today what you saw, and that was something the defense pushed back on, by the way, that characterization. But today you saw the prosecution start to describe the house in vivid detail. They show that video of the search. They show a lot of graphic at times, photos of the house. And then they showed the massage table. But Tom... They didn't show the massage. They didn't show a picture of it. They didn't show video of it. They brought an actual massage table from his home into the courtroom. Obviously a moment where they wanted to have the most impact on that jury. And the massage table is, of course, where the alleged abuse of many of these girls took place. Stephanie Gosk for us. Stephanie, we thank you for that. Back now with the interview that is sending shockwaves throughout Hollywood. Alec Baldwin speaking out about that deadly day on a New Mexico movie set, repeatedly saying the shooting was not his fault. Miguel Almaguer has more. Someone put a live bullet in a gun, a bullet that wasn't even supposed to be on the property. Bold and defiant, Alec Baldwin insisting it's not his fault cinematographer Helena Hutchins was shot and killed. I feel that... that, that uh, Someone is responsible for what happened, and I can't say who that is, but I know it's not me. Casting aside blame, Baldwin telling ABC News the gun that killed Hutchins and injured director Joel Souza went off in his hand while they were rehearsing a scene. Well, how about that? Does that work? You see that? Do you see that? She goes, yeah, that's good. I let go of the hammer. Bang, the gun goes off. Stressing he never fully cocked the weapon or pulled the trigger, chaos and confusion ensued. The gun was supposed to be empty. I was told I was handed an empty gun. She goes down. I thought to myself, did she faint? Two weapon experts we spoke with were skeptical a Colt revolver like this one could fire the way Baldwin describes. But through his attorney, assistant director Dave Halls also said he never saw Baldwin's finger on the trigger. There are some who say you're never supposed to point a gun at anyone on a set no matter what. Unless the person is the cinematographer who's directing me where to point the gun for her camera angle. The investigation here in New Mexico is now focused on how live ammo got onto the set. Today, the DA says she has not yet made a decision on any potential criminal charges. 
Tonight, Baldwin says he does not feel guilt and doesn't expect to be charged. She and I had this thing in common where we both thought it was empty, and it wasn't. And that's not her responsibility. That's not my responsibility. Whose responsibility is remains to be seen. Miguel Almaguer, NBC News. All right, we thank Miguel for that report. And for more analysis, we are joined again by the Prop Department Supervisor at UCLA School of Theater, Film, and Television, Kevin Williams. Kevin, great to have you back here on Top Story. So I, I just want to get right to it. You, you heard what Alec Baldwin's explanation of what happened was. Is that possible with that type of gun? If you sort of pull back the hammer and release it, will it fire? It is definitely plausible. Um, I will say that. And the reason I say that is because there have been times in my career where I've had a prop weapon, um, you know, nearly discharged because an actor has not understood fully how to disengage the hammer of the weapon once it's been cocked back. Um, now, in the event of him uh, pulling back on the hammer and releasing it, there may have been enough force. Again, I say it's plausible. I can't say I'm not familiar with the weapon that he had in his hands. Um, but ultimately, it comes down to, again, the question of why was there live rounds on the set to begin with? He says the gun was supposed to be empty when he was doing this. And, and I guess what I'm getting to is that does his explanation make sense? Could all of this happen, a series of sort of bad mistakes and then bad choices as well? Absolutely. Uh, in my opinion, professionally with my experience, I do believe that this is a plausible scenario that might have played out. Um, and as I've said before, it's literally worst case scenario. It's where all of the absolute wrong things have lined up and then you have the absolute worst outcome uh, of, a, of a mistake like this. So, yeah, I would say it it's, remains to be seen, but it's, it's plausible. Kevin, final question here. What still stands out for you as strange or bizarre about all of this? Um, you know, I know what my policies and procedures are when I'm either acting as a prop master or uh, handing over weapons to actors and the training that I engage with, with the performers that I work with. And uh, one of the things that I always like to do is make sure that the actor has the agency to ask questions or raise their flags if they feel anything is off. Um, the things that strike me as unusual is that the weapon was handed off without the cylinder being open. Um, again, hearing that the assistant director pulled the weapon from a cart without the actual armor or prop master handing it off to them, excuse me, um, you know, that all seems very strange and out of protocol, uh, at least in my experience. So it, there were definitely safety checks that were missed, and maybe this could have been avoided had there been more attention being paid. But again, we're getting into speculative territory when I start going down that road. Kevin Williams, we always appreciate your time and your analysis on this issue. Thank you. Now to that ongoing string of smash and grab robberies we've been following in California. Thieves breaking into stores, making off with hundreds of thousands of dollars in merchandise. And the new details tonight, many of those suspects no longer in custody. Aaron McLaughlin has more details from Los Angeles. Tonight in California, faced with crime and chaos at the height of the holiday shopping season, calls to reestablish law and order. Police need to arrest them. Prosecutors need to prosecute them. On Thursday, LA authorities announced 14 arrests with more than $330,000 worth of goods stolen in 11 smash and grab style incidents since November 18th. This latest crackdown falling flat for some after officials announced all suspects are no longer in police custody. You hear the astonishing amounts of property that's being stolen, hundreds of thousands of dollars, only 14 arrests. That's not going to discourage people from doing this, this type of crime. Nevertheless, it's the largest roundup since the holiday crime wave crashed across California, striking fear everywhere from major retailers to small boutiques. There's just so many people out, and it, it does make me a little bit nervous. The latest smashing up a mom and pop shop to the north in San Jose. $70,000 worth of jewels gone in 12 seconds. And last week, suspects stormed a Home Depot in Los Angeles, stealing sledgehammers and other items authorities believe they'll now use to continue their crime spree. They were holding up the hammers and they just said, like, get out of their way, and they were just saying that they would hurt you. All right, Aaron McLaughlin joins us now from Los Angeles. Aaron, I think that point you made in the story that some of the people who allegedly committed these crimes are already out of jail. How do they plan on stopping this problem throughout the holiday season? Because clearly they don't have a handle on it yet. 
Well, Tom, police say they're increasing their presence at shopping malls across the state. Even so, retailers say they're worried the police are outmatched, so they're upgrading their private security systems. Worth noting that some law enforcement officials are telling me that much of this crime is going underreported. Tom. Aaron McLaughlin for us tonight. Aaron, thank you. Now to the latest in the trial of Elizabeth Holmes, the disgraced Theranos CEO on the stand this week, acknowledging she made mistakes, but her defense is arguing they're not worthy of prison time. Our Emily Aketa has the intimate details revealed this week and breaks down what's to come. This week, bombshell testimony pulling back the curtain on the life of Theranos founder Elizabeth Holmes. The former Silicon Valley star taking the stand in her own defense, flanked by a growing entourage of sorority sisters. Holmes faces decades in prison if convicted of deceiving investors, doctors and patients while at the helm of her failed blood testing company. None of us should be surprised that Elizabeth Holmes took the stand in her own defense. She should feel very confident in her ability to persuade people. After all, she was able to build Build Theranos from virtually nothing at the age of 19. The defense submitting Holmes's personal notes, arguing she was under the influence of her second in command and former boyfriend, Sonny Balwani. The intimate details show a regimented schedule and strict tenets for herself. I show no excitement. I know the outcome of every encounter. My hands are always in my pockets or gesturing, Holmes wrote on a hotel notepad. Her defense also sharing instructions they say are directly from Balwani. He too faces fraud charges. I will learn what makes them tick and use that as bait to motivate them, Balwani wrote for Holmes. My life is about is about this company and it's about serving this company and doing the right thing for this company. In stark contrast to her poised nature seen in the media, Holmes unveiling a more vulnerable side, tearfully accusing Balwani of emotionally and sexually abusing her, something the former Theranos president has denied. You are one of the few people that has been able to see Elizabeth Holmes on the stand. Talk to me about what that's been like. It has been um, an eye-opening experience. She has appeared quite different than the Elizabeth Holmes you and I saw in her heyday. Came across as a strong, fearless CEO mirroring her idol Steve Jobs. On the stand, her defense team has really softened her image. At times, she has broken down. At times, she has been very happy, smiley, laughing, even apologizing. Prosecutors will continue questioning Holmes next Tuesday and will likely underscore her recent testimony that not only did she add pharmaceutical company logos to the Theranos lab reports without authorization, but she altered some of the language. And Tom, legal experts say jury deliberations could begin by the end of next week. Emily Aketa for us tonight. Emily, thank you. We turn out of money talks. What consumers and investors need to know from the business world and beyond. Tonight, U.S. job growth falling to its lowest pace in nearly a year. The economy only adding 210,000 jobs in November, a number well below Wall Street's expectations. NBC News senior business correspondent Stephanie Rule joins us now to break it all down for us. So, Steph, the U.S. was expected to add, let me see, more than 500,000 jobs, but only added, as we said, a little over 200,000. And the reality here here is this was before the news on Omicron really hit. So what should we make of this report? Hang tight before you get too worried over the last few months, because it's been complicated and difficult to report all the data to the Bureau of Labor and Statistics. We have seen over the last few months that number come out on the first Friday of the month and then weeks later it gets revised. And over the last few months, it's gotten revised quite a bit higher. So don't get yourself too concerned that, oh, my gosh, here we are at only 210,000. What the heck happened? Economists believe there's a good chance when we get the final number, it will be higher than that. One reason to believe that, other data we've gotten. We've now actually seen unemployment tick down to the lowest we've seen since the pandemic, while at the same time, we've seen the total number of Americans who are on the job hitting its highest point since pre-pandemic. So we have a lot of positive data on the jobs front. Stephanie, earlier in your life, you worked in investment banking. You, you came from Wall Street, so you know that world so well. So I wanted to get your take on a quote that came out that's getting a lot of buzz. It's something billionaire Charlie Munger, mm. who, of course, is Warren Buffett's top deputy at Berkshire Hathaway, said. He's also 97 years old. We should, we should point that out. He made this comment at a conference in Australia, and he said, the current market is, quote, even crazier than the dot-com boom that blew up in 2000, saying that companies are overvalued. So what's your reaction to that statement? Okay, so let me just say, Charlie Munger is far smarter than I when it comes to markets. <laughs> He's been saying that markets have been overvalued for quite some time, and from a fundamental perspective, he is absolutely right. 
But we are living in a time when you've got all sorts of individual investors, these meme stock traders, uh, these crypto enthusiasts who'd be looking at Charlie Munger, and they have been for the last year, saying, OK, Boomer, or OK, Boomer's grandfather, you don't know the new markets. And so right now, for the time being, markets have been flying. And when interest rates have been zero for this long, and the Fed has been buying bonds, having this very accommodative monetary policy, the only place to put your money is in the stock market. It because you've got it in a savings account, it's earning diddly squat. So Charlie Munger is absolutely right. The market is way overvalued. These numbers are crazy. However, there is no clear sign that they are go they're going to be going down anytime soon because the, ar the argument Charlie's making today, you could have made six months ago, you could have made 12 months ago, and it would have made sense. And what did the market do? It just kept going up. Stephanie Rule breaking down the markets for us here on Top Story. Steph, thank you. Still ahead tonight, the deadly crime spree in New York City. The man accused of stabbing at least three people in 12 hours, killing a, Colombian stu a Columbia student, what the suspect was doing when police found him in Central Park. Plus the SUV going airborne and crashing into a Pennsylvania fountain. You see it right there, what police say happened moments before the wild scene. And stolen money found, $600,000 reported missing from Joel Osteen's mega a church, but several years later, a plumber claims he found it inside the church walls. The details coming up. Back now in top story, an eyebrow raising turn of events for Joel Osteen's mega church in Houston. In 2014, $600,000 was reported missing from a safe. At least some of the money has now been found in the walls of that very same church. NBC News correspondent Maura Barrett has those details. I believe God has you in the palm of his hand. That you're see Tonight, missing money from one of the nation's largest churches. Everyone, thanks for coming out to Lakewood today. With a controversial celebrity pastor mysteriously discovered. A bold crime at Houston's Lakewood Church, the largest... You may remember when hundreds of thousands of dollars went missing from Joel Osteen's megachurch. Now, seven years later, at least some of it has been found inside the walls of that same church, Lakewood Church, behind a loose toilet. We've been talking about things that you found of value and we have been blown away. An anonymous man who says he was a plumber doing repair work told a local Texas radio station what he found. Went to go remove the toilet and I moved some insulation away and uh, about 500 envelopes fell out of the wall. A representative of the church acknowledged the discovery, saying in a statement, an undisclosed amount of cash and checks were found. Lakewood immediately notified the Houston Police Department. At the time, the church said the money stolen was from two days of donations. The Bible says that God is a rewarder. Osteen, as well as his wife and co-pastor Victoria, may be the most well-known preachers of the so-called prosperity gospel. It's an evangelical belief that strong faith will lead to riches. Keep your expectation out there. God wants to show out in your life. Not in the sweet by and by, but how about in 2021? It, it, I say it's uniquely American because uh, it is essentially capitalism with a veneer of Christianity uh, uh, on top of it. Church donation figures are not public, but a report from the Houston Chronicle included a 2017 financial statement revealing more than $80 million in contributions the previous year. Osteen himself has faced harsh criticism for his lavish lifestyle and questioned over his decision to keep the church closed during Hurricane Harvey when most area churches were providing refuge for displaced people. We were waiting for the right time. Really, Lakewood is always open. We just didn't necessarily have staff here the night that it flooded out here. After criticism, he opened the doors as a shelter. I think couldn't look more different than, you know, the, the image that we have of Jesus in the Gospels. Now, more money flowing, found in the walls. There are no new clues indicating how the money disappeared in the first place, but the Houston police tell me their investigation is ongoing. We've also been in touch with Lakewood, asking them to respond to some of the criticisms in our piece, but they declined to comment in time for our air. We'll stay on the story. Tom? All right, a wild one indeed. Maura, thank you for that. When we come back, questions over those at-home COVID tests. Many families rely on them as they gather for the holidays, but can they detect the Omicron variant or being thrown off by it? Our Ellison Barber went inside one of the test's biggest manufacturers to find out.
All right, now to Top Stories News Feed, and we begin with a deadly crime spree across New York City. Police say a 30-year-old Columbia University PhD, PhD student was stabbed to death inside a Manhattan park. A 27-year-old tourist was also stabbed in the stomach, but is expected to survive. Police finding the suspect in Central Park as he approached another person with a kitchen knife. He's also accused of stabbing a fourth person that day before all of the attacks. They appear to be random. And the SUV going airborne after fleeing from another crash. Surveillance video captured the vehicle. Check this out. Speeding through an intersection before flying into a fountain in Franklin County, Pennsylvania. Authorities say the driver who they believe was intoxicated was involved in a hit and run moments before the driver was hospitalized, but he's expected to be okay. We're going to continue our coverage now on the Omicron variant. Many Americans rely on the at home test to stay safe, but do those kits still work against the new strain or can they be thrown off by them? Our team put that question to scientists at one of the biggest at home test manufacturers in the country. Here's NBC News correspondent Ellison Barber with that exclusive look. For many families, at home over the counter rapid tests like this two, three, are a holiday safety net. So it's been 15 minutes, and you can see here, negative. But with the Frankenstein mix of Omicron's mutations, do they still work? <laughs> Abbott is one of the largest manufacturers of at home COVID tests, and Dr. Mary Rogers is one of their top virus hunters. As families are preparing to travel for the holidays and they're looking at safety nets to make sure they can safely gather, are you confident that when they pick up an Abbott by Next Now kit that they can trust the results of that with this new variant? Absolutely, yes. We aren't allowed past this line because inside this room there are COVID samples and those samples must be stored in one of the most secure biosafety labs. They don't have an Omicron physical sample in this lab, but they do have its sequence. When word of Omicron began to spread, Rogers was already running its sequence to make sure Abbott's at-home kits would still detect COVID. Was there a moment where you were nervous and unsure if your test would work for this new variant. We always have a sense of urgency anytime we're looking at a sequence to understand whether it could impact our test. And so as I looked through the data, it was kind of like I was holding my breath as I was looking through it. And then when I got to the end and saw through all of the sections of our targets that we have conservation, it was a breath of fresh air to be like, this is okay. We can com be confident in the results of our tests. The FDA has approved at home over the counter rapid tests from 10 different companies. NBC News reached out to all 10. So far, we've heard back from six, and all six say they've run the Omicron sequence and their at home rapid test detected. Two of them, Abbott and Access Bio, say they've also successfully tested their kits with a physical sample of the Omicron variant. But just because the test works with the Omicron mutation doesn't mean it always will. Is there a scenario where the at-home rapid test might not work or need to be redesigned for a different variant? It's absolutely possible. And that's why we do the work that we do, because as soon as that kind of a mutation occurs, we need to know immediately. Such an important maid right there. Ellison Barber joins us now from the Abbott Lab headquarters in Illinois. She's inside of a working lab. That's why you can see her suited up. So, Ellison, these at-home tests, they'll only tell if you're positive for COVID or if you're negative, but they won't necessarily tell you if you have the Omicron variant. You're going to show our viewers now exactly how that process is done because it takes time. Yeah, it is a long, laborious process, and it has to take place in a lab. You're right, COVID tests, whether it's one at home or one that you get in your doctor's office, it is just looking to tell you whether or not you have COVID-19. In order for a scientist to determine what variant of COVID-19 an individual has, they have to be in a highly special lab, specialized lab just like this one. They need a physical sample of COVID-19. They extract a sequence from that it is a process that takes hours and again they need these types of machines all of this technical equipment in order to do it tom 
All right, Elson Barber for us. Now to Top Stories Global Watch. Germany has become the latest country to announce a nationwide lockdown for the unvaccinated. In one of her final acts as Chancellor, Angela Merkel announced unvaccinated Germans will be banned from most businesses. The country also moving to make vaccines mandatory by February. Germany is in its fourth and most severe coronavirus wave. And the shocking new images from Spain's La Palma Island as it deals with nearly three months of nonstop volcanic eruptions. Look at this. These images show abandoned towns covered in mountains of volcanic ash. They almost look fake. Entire homes and buildings submerged. The volcano began erupting on September 19th, and experts say it's showing no signs of slowing down. Thousands of homes and buildings have been destroyed. Coming up, some big changes underway. A News Now welcome. Joshua Johnson joins Top Story with a preview of his big new show, which premieres on Monday, including a big interview with us. What makes this man and what's going to make the show and why Florida rocks? Stay with us. We're back now with a preview and a warm welcome to the newest member of the NBC News Now family. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, premiering Monday, we'll create a new space to talk about the news of the day, as well as issues impacting people around the country. And we are lucky tonight to have the host right here with us. And I want to start off, Florida gets such a bad rap in the news. Yeah. And here we are, two men of Florida. That's right. Proud men of Florida, That's right? right? The great of South state of Florida. Florida of South Florida, even better. The, the, the state of South Florida. <laughs> here holding on the fort for news now, uh, Joshua, first of all, I've gotten to know you over the past few days. Nice to meet you. Likewise. So glad to have you as a partner here at this network. I want to talk about your show, but I want to start with your perception of the news and your take on the news. Because you're like me. You still believe in true news, objective news, and the value of news in this community. I do. And I think that in a, in a society right now that is so very polarized, and you know, Polarization is kind of inherent to being American. We fought a revolution so we could argue over politics after all. But if you're going to have that kind of polarization, we then need some spaces where we can meet in the middle. My problem is not, and really has never been, with the presence of the conflict. It's the absence of connection. And so our job on our show is to create a space, an hour a night, five nights a week, where you can, if you choose, connect. Whether or not you want to argue the rest of the week is fine, but you should at least have some space on air where you don't have to be met with clenched fists where you can be met more with open arms. You're talking about a show where there's not going to be shouting, yep. but people may have different opinions. Oh, yeah, and they may be very strong opinions. I'm not against strong opinions. My goal is to do a program that's more light than heat, but not all light and no heat, right? We don't want it to feel cold and clinical. We want to be able to get into the things that have people fired up, but do it in a way that acknowledges the arguments, that acknowledges where people are, and then can kind of step back and go, okay, if you're willing, let's all just talk about this, try to make sense of this, and make room to kind of vent some of that heat in a useful way. I think your take is brilliant. I think one of the things you said, and we talked about this before, is that you think a lot of times issues aren't just black and white. There's a lot of gray, and people forget that. And when we sort of go to our corners, our, our respective corners, it gets boring because we're not learning from the other side. It gets boring. It loses its utility very quickly. And it's kind of a, a, a way of bonding with other people that lacks depth. You know, in our debut week, we're going to speak to the author, Brene Brown, who has a new book out called At of the heart. And one of the things we talked about in our conversation, which we can share with you, is about how connecting through that kind of social conflict just doesn't really have the same impact as deeper, more meaningful three-dimensional connections. Here's part of what she said. What is it that we're missing out on if we agree, oh yeah, those people are the ones who are screwing the world up? God, it feels so good that <laughs> like, oh my God, I hate the same people. <laughs> we are best friends. And we're not talking about like Yankees, Red Sox. We're talking about something like, like political. Yeah, we're talking about vaccines. We're talking about politics. Right. The thing is that if all we have in common is that we hate the same people, it doesn't give us very much to build a relationship on. And I'm not here to judge the people that you may like or dislike. Yeah. Your views are your business. But if that's all you have, right. I think you deserve something else. I think you at least deserve the option yeah. to have a different kind of conversation at the end of the day. Right, because, and I, I told you this earlier, when you're not growing, you're dying. And if you stay in your respective corners, sometimes you can start slowly dying because you're not learning anymore and you're not growing with other people. And we talked about our, our, our sort of experiences in South Florida where you were so, sort of forced to learn mm -hmm. from other groups. You had... Cuban Americans, Haitian Americans, black, white, Venezuelan Americans, every religion possible, all in not really a large area. And so your food, your music, 
what you think your politics all gets mixed together. Well, and then even, I mean, even within those groups, I mean, I remember having to learn that depending on what generation Cuban American you were, right. your politics could be very different than your parents who were here during the Mariel boat lift, than maybe their grandparents who remember Fulgencio Batista in 1959. Right. Like, to Cubans coming right now. Exactly. Right. So all of that nuance may be complicated, but we're built for that right. as an organization. And so if we never do the work of, yes, this is a real word, complexifying right. these stories, we're kind of doing lazy journalism. At right. the very worst, at the very best, we're doing incomplete journalism. But here we have the room for that. We have the appetite for that. And if people will interact, we can tell amazingly rich stories about who we are and how we live. All right. I, I'm going to be watching. Again, I'm happy you're going to be a partner at this network with me. I'm going to look forward to your show every night. Uh, and we will see you here Monday through Friday. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson premiering this Monday right after Top Story at 8 o'clock. Joshua, thank you. We thank you for watching Top Story tonight and every night right here on News Now. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Have a great weekend. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.